Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Love. Of all the gifts God has given us, love has been twisted and perverted by sinful human beings, more so, I think, than any other. With every new generation, we invent new takes, new twists, and new turns on what we think love is and what we think love should be. If you made a list of all the platitudes about love, it would be never-ending. Things such as love is like a warm puppy. Really, anything having to do with dogs at this point (laughs) has been related to love. Forget God, dog is love to some people. Love is whatever your heart desires. Love doesn't discriminate. Love is love. That's a good one. (laughs) Love is whatever makes you happy. It's like we live in a bad Disney movie. (laughs) Of course, the revolving door of ideas about love is nothing new or unique to our moment in time. For as long as man has walked the earth, he has grappled with the true meaning and the true nature of love, and he has struggled to articulate in meaningful terms what love really is. And in one sense, this reality speaks to us as human beings being made in the image of God, the imago Dei, that God has created within us a longing for the good, the true, and the beautiful. But with every man-made iteration of what love is or what love should be, we stray further from God's perfect design. Each of the examples I just gave fall woefully short of the true depth and beauty of God's divine love. It's as if we're on a trip to the beach and we get out of the car and we're spending all of our time playing around in a puddle of water in the parking lot. (laughs) Yet just over the dunes is the vast endless, bottomless ocean with all the adventure and mystery that comes with it. And yet we willfully, stubbornly refuse to consider anything else than splashing in a puddle of water in the parking lot. More than that, our sinful hearts have so twisted so-called love into self-serving cultural narratives that allow us to pursue any pleasure, no matter how perverse, so long as it makes you happy, so long as it doesn't whiff of anything resembling the Orthodox Christian faith. So why am I ranting about all of this? It's because the cultural treatment of love forms the backdrop of our readings today. And because the image of love offered to us by Jesus in his discourse in the Gospel of John today gives us the antidote to all of the false images of love which surround us. And as Christians, we of all people are called to understand the true nature of love and to share it with a lost and dying world in deed and in truth. Let's start by looking at the passage from the 14th chapter of John's Gospel. 
This passage picks up in the middle of what is understood in the Johannine narrative as the supper discourses. That is, a recounting of exhortations which Jesus gives to his disciples at the time of the Last Supper. Jesus is preparing his disciples for coming events, not only for his passion, his death, and his resurrection, but also for their future life together as a community of believers after Jesus has left the earth in his body. And as we will see, the tradition of John so brilliantly ties Jesus' words here to John's later epistles to the early church, which we also have before us today, reminding us that the true foundation of Christian unity and Christian witness is sacrificial love. The passage begins, Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. Yes, Jesus is here alluding to the coming of the Holy Spirit, who will indwell the church at Pentecost. But what Jesus says at the start cannot be overlooked. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Here we encounter, as we often do, a conditional statement, which means we're up against a hard saying. If A, then B. That is, you cannot have one thing without having The other. So here, what Jesus is saying is huge. If we truly love him, then naturally it follows that it must result in us keeping his commandments. And this reality can be a stumbling block for us, for both believers new and old. We hear Jesus' words, and naturally we want to think, well, wait a minute, that sounds like his love is conditional. We think in order to love Jesus, in order to be loved by him, then I have to do what he says. We are constantly tempted to slip back into this pattern of works righteousness, especially when we first come to faith or we're struggling with some sin and we're seeking repentance and reconciliation. We think the only way Jesus will accept me is if I clean myself up first and I get my act back together. In order to be a child of God, I truly need to have it all together. Brothers and sisters, we all know this is a lie. Our salvation is bought by the blood of Christ alone, and we need only faith in him to receive adoption into the family of God. But make no mistake, God's divine love is so deep, so transformative, that the driving force of the Christian life should be none other than to serve the God whom we love. The end of this passage, in this sense, is incredibly clarifying. Jesus says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The keeping of Jesus' commandments is an overflow of our love for him. What's more is that this love is reciprocal. As we love the Son, we are guaranteed not only his love, but the love of his Father in heaven. Beloved, this is Jesus showing us the ocean. True, sacrificial love for Christ can do nothing but grow deeper and grow wider and more vast. This is a call to us at the puddle, out over the dunes to behold the sea. The love of God 
as a never-failing positive feedback loop as our love for Christ deepens, our relationship to the Godhead deepens as well, which then motivates us to manifest that love in deeper personal sacrifice for our Lord. And as that happens, Christ becomes ever more manifest in our lives, and so on, and so on. So which are we going to choose? The puddle? Love is love. Or the ocean? He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This type of love foundational to all other kinds, is known as agape love. This is a self-sacrificing love, a love that is self-giving. This is the type of love that Christ demonstrates to us when he died for us on the cross, bearing the ultimate shame and suffering for our sins. This is why true agape love divine love extends far beyond puppy kisses, far beyond merely what makes us happy. True Christian love is rooted in self-sacrifice. And because Jesus took the first step in saving us on the cross, the ultimate example of self-sacrifice, we have assurance that our keeping his commandments is not an exercise in self-righteousness, in works righteousness, but rather an imitation of what he so lovingly did first for us. He laid down his life for our sins. So we understand that true divine love is rooted not in feelings, not in pleasure, but in willing self-sacrifice for the one or for the ones who we love. And if we twist the glass then and change our frame of reference, we see that this also means love is not always doing what is convenient for us. It means love is not always doing or saying the easy thing saying the thing that people want us to hear. Rather, love includes doing uncomfortable things, sometimes for people we may not totally like, and for people whom we may not always associate with or with whom we do not get along. John's first letter today drives this point home. Recall that John is admonishing a severely divided church in this letter. Verse 18, then, should hit us like a shot across the bow. He says, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. That's a tough pill for us to swallow. We like word and talk, don't we? Talking is easy. When we talk about our problems, it makes us feel as if we're accomplishing something. It makes us feel as if we're making a difference. But until our love for Christ manifests itself in self-sacrificing love and action for other people, it doesn't make an ounce of difference. True, word and talk can be useful, but they can only go so far. In fact, the vehicle of God's love for us manifested in our lives, the glue that holds together the Christian community is the action of keeping Christ's commandments. John goes on to explain, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. 
just as he has commanded us. We are reminded that Jesus' commandments are indeed the summary of the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You cannot rightly love your neighbor without first loving God, and you cannot truly love God without being motivated to love your neighbor as yourself. And as we soon break these commandments in the name of self-interest or convenience or comfort, then the fabric of our Christian community will unravel. And indeed, so too will our own lives. So the challenge for us is this. Will we love one another when it is difficult, even costly, to do so? Make no mistake, we are constantly under pressure from the outside world to cave to the idol of self-preservation and convenience. As we come out on the other side of a pandemic, stepping into a transformed culture, we as Christians will feel an increased pressure. That is the pressure on the Christian community to adopt and capitulate to distorted views of love will continue to increase exponentially. Sisters and brothers, we must be wary not to be deceived by what the world tells us is love, tells us what love should be, tells us what it means to love our neighbor. The most salient example that I see today is self-preservation masquerading as love. That is the incessant cry in every facet of our lives to base every single decision we make on the risk to our health, all in the name of loving our neighbor. Let's be clear, I'm not advocating for cavalier or reckless behavior or taking on risk carelessly, but what I am saying and what Jesus clearly lays out for us on the cross is that love of neighbor involves risk. It involves risk and it involves personal sacrifice. And what society wants to tell us is that we can love other people without ever having to sacrifice anything of our own. And what we're going to see moving forward is society sorting itself out into buckets, none the least of which will be the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. And the church is going to be pressured to do exactly the same. My point is this, divine Christian love is the only antidote to all the false images of love that the world tries to get us to believe. And true Christian love must cut against every cultural temptation. Agape love does not and cannot determine when to love or care for someone based on whether or not that person has received a vaccine. The call of the gospel has always been to take the gospel to the marginalized and the outcast. Woe to the church then if she contributes to creating a new group of outcasts under the guise of loving one's neighbor. But praise God that his love for us through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit never changes. The world's idea of love changes daily But God's love never changes, and it will never fail us. May we, by the Holy Spirit, be empowered to the work of ministry by this glorious truth. Let us finish by looking to the example of St. Philip from Acts, a prime example of our call to love our neighbor. Philip shares the gospel with an Ethiopian eunuch, one who would have been emasculated as part of his political position, 
and four, his physical emasculation would have hit, been barred by, from the inner courts of the temple and even treated as something of an outcast in the Jewish community. But Philip tells him the good news of Jesus, and he believes, and with great joy, he is baptized. Indeed, this account shows that the spread of Christianity outside of Judaism was part of God's plan. And for us, it is an example that the love of God, the love of neighbor, the love of the gospel cuts across all cultural and social divisions. May we then follow in Philip's example and love not merely in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And may God so unite us in the self-sacrificing love of his Son that we may with boldness make that same love manifest to the world around us. Amen. Amen.